Hey, hello friends, Dan Nelson here. Thanks for watching me today. Um, this is a painting I did uh, on, hello again, aesthetist. Good to have you on board. All the way from Russia, I believe. Uh, this is a painting I did last Friday, 30 by 40 inches of a church in downtown Raleigh. There was, they had a garden party. It was a fundraiser for a charity organization in town. Had a great time, sold for a very good price, I'm happy to say. And, uh, but I'm going to finish. I don't, I've never done a video like this before. I'm going to show you the several steps that I go through. One is I'm going to finish the painting very quickly. Then I'm going to paint the edges, top and bottom. Then I'm going to put a wire on it. Then, get, then I'm going to take it out to my garage to photograph it. Then I'm going to take the it, photograph to Photoshop in my computer in my office. So that's like five different steps that need to be done with virtually every painting. Now, not every, you know, what I'm doing now is a little bit more than just uh, f finishing uh, details. This is actually finishing the painting. Okay, so I'm looking at this painting, and um, it, as far as my clients on Friday were concerned, the painting was finished, and certainly it could stand right just the way it is. I could, I could hang it with... No embarrassment. I could say, no, it's finished, and nobody would nobody would think anything of it. they say, yeah, that's lovely, great. But I want to show, I hope you guys can see the before and after when you, when you glaze. As you know, I'm a huge believer in glazing. Um, why? Because transparent colors are more complex than opaque colors. And the way this is right now, there's quite a bit of opaque color on the canvas. So on top of most of this opacity, on most of this opaque paint, I'm going to apply several different colors and so forth of transparent paint. And since transparent color is far more, I'm talking like in the physics realm, high school physics class, uh, transparent colors are much richer or more complex than opaque colors. And since our eyeballs, our brain really, but the seeing part of our brain, what I call our eyeballs, since our eyeballs, given the choice, our eyeballs would rather see more rather than less. Does that make sense? Our eyes never get tired of seeing. It's like, oh, my eyes have seen too much stuff today. They're just tired of, I think I'll just sit here and close them. Nope, never happens. Now we can get tired eyes, but it's not from seeing too much. It's from <laughs> eye strain and all kinds of other issues. But given the choice, again, our eyes like to see lots rather than little. And so this is one way to, tra to transition my painting from less to more. And there's always a, forgive me, but there's always a sophomoric, look it up, there's al always a sm sophomoric that essentially means someone who's pretending to be smart, but has out outstripped their own smartness. So they're quoting other people who they think are smart. There's always a sophomoric, sophomoric smart aleck who will say, but uh, less is more. Okay, I actually have a whole page. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to stay in the final edit, but I actually have an entire page in my book dedicated to shooting down this ubiquitous half-brained parroting uh, by half-educated, half-intelligent people who spout less is more. <laughs> I know I'm saying that with a horribly smart aleck attitude, but it's one of those statements that needs some, that statement needs to be mocked so that it will drop out of ubiquitous usage in our culture. There is a, there is a grain of truth in the statement, less is more, because sometimes, uh, as human beings, we tend to overdo things. Therefore, hum many human beings need to be reminded often that less is more. 
But look it up in the dictionary. Less means less and more we means more. That's why we call more more. And our eyes prefer to see more, not less. Now for students, sometimes a student artist needs to discover that, oh, you know, it's actually better to do less. And that's part of where that statement came from. But don't spout it off to me as if you're saying some deep, 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 deep philosophical truth because you're not. The, the fact is less is more is a pleasant irony. Look it up. What irony means. It's not a literalism. It's an irony. Anyway, so <laughs> you can tell I'm a little hot under the collar about that one, can't you? So don't say less is more. No, more is more. And our eyes like seeing, prefer to see, like to see more. So what I'm putting on the canvas right now is more. And again, I don't know if you can see any difference, but I can already see a difference in this painting. It is a better painting now than it was two minutes ago. Why? Because our eyes like to see more. So I'm putting, uh, because I'm putting a transparent color on top of all this opaque stuff, all of a sudden, all of these colors are just coming alive. They're more intense than they were a few minutes ago. They're more. And our eyes enjoy more. And uh, more beautiful. The, the painting is more beautiful than it was a few minutes ago. And uh, this may be all that I do to the painting. It just, just glaze it. That might be all that I'm going to do. I don't know. I think I'm probably going to do just a little bit more than that. More. Um... I'm going to, now I'm putting violet purple on my brushes. I'm gonna, whoops, I picked up more red than I, than I wanted to. Permanent, permanent rose is probably my favorite, all time favorite red color is permanent rose. Whoops, and that's just too much of that. Too much of a good thing. <laughs> I'm taking some of that purple off. There we go. I'm essentially darkening the bottom, as you can tell, the bottom tier of the painting. I'm making it darker. It, the composition of the painting is working better as I make this this bottom the bottom edge of the painting darker. Okay, now let's see. See what else needs to be done. Usually, after glazing a painting, usually I will come in with a rag and lift out areas to make them lighter. And I do believe I want to do that here in the sky. Okay, and I think I also want to do a little bit here in the, the lights in the church window. I think I want to hit the top of this roof. I really like the way that little bit of that roof and then up here as well. So just, uh, you know, painting with a rag is so much fun. You get so much control with without slipping into over control, overdoing it. Yeah, I think that's nice. Um, there was, as I finished the other night and was tired and out of time and tired, I looked, took, you know, as I was taking my last glances at the thing, I thought, you know what, I think, I think I want a, just a little bit more definition up here, whoops, in these trees. So, 
Let me do just a little bit, some of these branches, likewise up here. I know you're getting a terrible glare there. Not sure if there's anything I can do about that, sorry. Having done just a little bit of dark details, now I'm going to come back. Remember, anytime you do dark, it's usually a, a setup for doing light, as indeed, as it is in this case. So I did some dark branches up there, right, in the sky. So that gives me the opportunity To, to re-emphasize a little bit of the light up here in the sky. And I have no idea if I've got the right color here or not. Nope, it needs to be warmer than that. Needs to be warmer than that still. Let me see if this is the right color. Yeah, there we go. I think this is probably the, uh, maybe the only thing we're gonna paint. It's too bright, too light, too light, too bright. Let's try this now. Yeah, too too green. Too green now. I'm doing a lot of painting with my fingers at the moment, aren't I? And again, part of what gives me the freedom to paint with my fingers is I know you've heard this before, but I have no no cobalts and no cadmiums in my, on my palette. Does that make the glare any better or worse? Hey, let me try that again. Thank you, Elise. Appreciate that very much. Can I go like this? Nope, it won't stay that way. Okay, forgive me for the bad glare there. I'm just going to finish this as quickly as I can. 
and move on to other things. Again, so I don't have any cobalt or cadmium paints on my palette. Um, if I did, I, I, I would not be using my fingers at all. I don't believe I have any toxic pigments in my, on my palette at all. Okay, I think I'm done with the sky. I'm going to do just a tiny bit. Sorry, my box of Kleenex is falling apart. Hang on. Okay, I think I'm going to do just a little bit of highlights down here. Just a little bit, and then I'll call the painting really finished. So this is, I would say, pretty typical of if I have the, the opportunity to touch a painting on day two, so to speak, on a second day, this is pretty typical of the kind of stuff you might find me doing. So I just did a little bit of glow on those uh, lights, that string of lights. Then I'm going to come back and punch those lights just one more time. Yeah, that's better. Just a little bit more punch. Same thing down here. Yeah, and then down here, there were candles on the, on the tables and I, I didn't do as much glow on those candles as I would have liked. So I'm gonna do that right now. Thanks, sweetie. Mm -hmm. My lunch has arrived. It means it's a good time to take a little break. By the way, here's a great, great uh, application of this principle. When you're painting, when you're painting something that's glowing, like a candle, you paint the glow first which at the moment I'm doing with my finger. You see that? Paint the glow first, and then paint the thing that's glowing. In this case, the flame or the light of the candle. Does that make sense? Doesn't work the other way around. So let me do it again. Let me zoom in here real close so you can see one example. I've already got a candle on the table, but I'm going to, I want it to glow a whole lot more than that. So I just... Paint the glow, and then come back and paint, if you will, the thing that's doing the glowing, in this case, the candle flame. Got it? Just a simple little trick. If you try to do it the other way around, it, it's, it takes a long time. One more time. This time here, way down here in the corner. Paint the glow. This would same thing would apply to a sunset. Same thing would apply to tail lights, headlights on cars, traffic lights, street lights, uh, windows from a distance, and so on and so forth. 
paint the fuzz first and then come back and paint the, the hard center of the fuzz. Um, I think I'm going to do one more. I, could, I can't remember if, this, if there were candles up here, but there should have been. <laughs> do you hear me? I don't know if they, were, if, they, if they set up candles on these tables up here, but I, they should have if they didn't. So I'm going to paint as though they had, in fact, yes, set uh, candles on those tables. One more right there. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so I'm done with phase one of this final touch-up. Uh, is finish the painting. I'm done with phase one, finish the painting, uh, which as you can see, didn't take me very long, 10, 15 minutes at the most. Next stage, I'm gonna take a little break right here. Next, I'm gonna paint the top and the bottom. Sure, I want you to watch me do that. All right, so step two in the finishing a painting department is painting the edges of the canvas. The sides are done, because I paint those while I am doing the painting. The top and the bottom are not done. Uh, let me show you real quickly here my, my palette arrangement. I think, I think you're familiar with this. So these little containers are all acrylics with about 50% uh, medium. What medium, you ask? Well, my favorite is this, is GAC 100. That's my favorite acrylic medium. I use Liquitex uh, gloss medium and varnish at times. I've got a piece of glass in between these little. It's uh, So the paint is roughly 50-50, but that's because usually I use a fairly inexpensive uh, brand of acrylics because I find it works just fine. Okay, so I've never found a color that I'm not able to match. I've never, I've never been stuck. Uh, the colors I have here that you saw a minute ago are basically purple, violet, purple, um, permanent rose, orange, any old orange, yellow, any old yellow, phthalo blue and ultramarine blue. That's pretty important. And then brown, any old brown, and of course, titanium white. And uh, a mix, achieve color uh, again by layering any number, any number of colors, any any number of layers till this matches this. Now this is a, a very easy one as you can see because virtually the entire bottom of this painting is all the same color. So, uh, and the top is pretty easy too. So you're, you're seeing me <laughs> do a very, very simple, simple painting. Many times, of course, there are details coming down to the bottom of the canvas, which case I carry the details on around to the bottom to some degree. And of course, the purpose of this is called the gallery wrap. The purpose is so that the owner doesn't have to frame the painting. Some people still do frame paintings. I have discovered over the last several years that interior designers, people who decorate houses and buildings, are very strongly inclined not to frame paintings. They frame all kinds of other things, but they don't frame paintings. Kind of funny. Okay, that's actually good enough. That was pretty quick. I'll rinse those brushes off, so I'll turn it over now. Which is a little bit tricky because, of course, the edges are quite wet. Okay. And as you maybe saw a minute ago, I'm using my favorite brushes, these chip brushes, cheap chip brushes. <laughs> Little play on words there. Cheap chip, chip cheap brushes. 
and you just match color that's all just match the color now on this I'll, I will be using some white as well as well as the uh, the transparent so I'm assuming I showed you my little pots of paint let me show you again if anybody just joined us right I, I'm assuming you understand these are all transparent are they transparent because I went out and bought a bottle of paint that says transparent? The answer is no, 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 no. It's not because I bought transparent paint. It's because I added enough medium to the paint to make it transparent, okay? I, I'm asked that question all the time. Where do you buy your transparent paints? No, 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 no. You misunderstand. Same thing with oils. Um, it's not because I bought transparent paints, because I made them transparent by adding uh, a substantial amount of medium to the paint so that they are then transparent. Okay, glad we got that straightened out. And again, my favorite medium, there are many mediums, but my favorite is GAC 100. It's kind of expensive. Liquitex is a little bit cheaper. You can find other cheap brands too, which I think work okay. The cheaper ones tend to dry a little more rubbery, and the more expensive ones tend to dry more uh, crystal clear. So that seems to be the difference between a really good glaze and a not so good acrylic medium. I should say not glaze, but medium. Same thing, I'm using it as a glaze. Okay wiping those now a little bit of white on my brushes and a little bit of orange to try to match the color of the the cloud see that right there it's, it's got a slight greenish tint to it one of the advantages of painting with two hands is that you can uh, I have to use my right hand on this one. You can mix the colors right on your brushes faster than mixing, faster than mixing um, on the on a palette. No big deal. Feel free to mix on a palette if you want to. It's a little bit faster. I find mixing it on two brushes. Okay, just about done here. Actually, I'm probably boring you to tears, so. Let me take a break here real quickly. Uh, the next thing I'm going to be doing is putting a wire on the back. And just for what it's worth, I'll show you how I do that. By no means, am I, like there's many different ways to put wires on paintings. My way is not the best way, it's just one way. But you might be interested in seeing, there was a time in my career when I would have liked to see how somebody how some people put a wire. Many different ways to do it. I'll just show you my way. Okay, I'll be back in a few. All right, so I'm back. I'm gonna show you how I put a wire on the back of a painting. Many ways to do this. This is just one way. It's my favorite way, but it's just one way. Basically, th besides the wire, you need three tools. Needle nose vice grips wire cutters, complete with pretty pink handles, you'll notice. And this unusual tool, I just looked it up, I just Googled it a minute ago. It's called a universal screw starter. Let's see, can I get you close enough? Uh, the last time I showed this to my viewers, someone said, oh, that's an awl. Well, no, it's not an awl. Maybe, maybe some people call it an all, but an awl is just a pointed piece of metal and this has as you can see has screws on it okay um, now the kind of the the, the 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 hardware that I like to use to hang paintings with is an eye hook and they go in this way let me talk just for a second about the other perhaps even more common way of hanging a painting which is these I don't know what you call them flapper hooks. 
okay? And these mount like this. Let me make sure, yeah, this, the top of my painting is here. By the way, you'll notice my painting is away from me and vertical. I used to try to do this while it was horizontal, then discovered, what am I doing? It's a lot easier to do this whole operation with the painting vertical. Um, this is a very, very, very popular way of, of doing, uh, 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 hanging, a, uh, putting a wire on a painting. I'll tell you what, I don't, I don't like it. When you do it here, it mounts here. I suppose you could mount it there, although I've never seen anybody do it that way. Maybe somebody, maybe one of you does, but it's usually done here. Here's why I don't like it. When you do this, this piece of metal then stays in contact with the wall on which the painting is hanging. And anytime you've got metal in contact with a painted surface, like the wall of your home, that eventually is going to cause a mark on the, on the wall. So I don't like this because it makes marks. I use it in an emergency, but I don't like it. Okay, so I'm gonna use an eye hook. So I come down about six inches, about one fourth of the way from here to here, come down about one fourth, so I typically just use my fingers. And here's what a screw starter is good for. See, now that's that's already about a dozen turns that's well started. So that hole now has thread marks in it. Does that make sense? You don't need to use a tool like that. I just looked it up. And if you're looking for it, Google or do a search for Universal screw starter. It's an old-fashioned tool, but it is still available. In fact, I'm ordering a backup one as we speak. Now, the needle nose vice grips, regular vice grips won't work. It does need to be the skinny kind. Very inexpensive. You can buy them anywhere. Hold to hold your your eye, your screw eye, and of course, just screw it in. It's very easy, very easy, no muss, no fuss. One of the reasons I like my technique for um putting wires is I don't need a drill. I don't need a power drill, especially with this screw starter. And by the way, it is not, just in case you're wondering, how far is the screw, the screw eye down from here? Does it have to be exactly the same down here? And the answer is no, it does not. It does not matter. Close is good enough. Okay, so you do not have to have a ruler as a part of your kit. No, close is plenty good enough. It does not need to be exactly the same. Okay, back to the vice grips. Put it in there. And in just a few turns. That eye is not going anywhere for a very long time. Okay. Um, let me show you just one other part of my just for what it's worth. It's, this is dirty, but this is my little jar of wire. This goes in my, my car, my, which my, my, my van is a uh, art studio on wheels, as you know. And so I always keep all my stuff together. Just That's because I'm a obsessive compulsive, which is another way of saying I'm intelligent. <laughs> Not OCD. OCD is an issue. That, 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 that's bad news. But just orderly, obsessive compulsive. That's so. I like things. I like things in order. That's just my personality. It does not need to be yours. And I am very much kidding about the intelligent part. <laughs> and just about, just about out of wire here. That, that's gonna. This, this, what's left over here is gonna do one very small painting. So good thing I have more wire out in the garage. Now just a real quick comment about how tight or how loose should this wire be. I've seen it done poorly both ways. You don't want it, you do not want it like this, tight. You don't want it that tight. Nor do you want it, like some people do, like this. If you do this, the painting will sag, can, can hang. If this is a wall, are you with me? The painting can hang like this if it's too loose. So you want it just a little bit loose. Now just one, one caveat, one, so see, see about like that? Um, if you're hanging a really large painting, anything larger than 36 by 48, 
anything larger than three by four feet, that's like one by one and a half meters, something like that, um, you will want this to be looser. I don't know if I can describe this to you. You want it to be slightly, the bigger the painting is, this has to be slightly looser. Why? Because for a really big painting, somebody needs to get under, behind the painting, underneath, behind the painting. Now the wall is here. Are you with me? And the painting's on my back. And I need you to get it inside there and hook the wire over the, over the hook in the wall. So there you go. Okay, I'm now ready for next stage, next phase of finisher painting, which is out in the garage where I'm going to shoot photographs. And if you haven't seen this before, you need to see this. All right, welcome back. Ah, Elise, how can I glaze? Good question. The answer is, how can I glaze? I don't know if you're still watching or if you'll watch this later. How can I glaze so soon after finishing an oil painting? The answer is, I use liquin in almost all of my oil colors. And when it comes to titanium white, I use alkyd, A-L-K-Y-D, alkyd, which means oil paint that has a fast drying alkaline chemical in it. Uh, so that's how my oil paintings are almost all completely dry overnight. Very good question. Now that painting that you just, that I just did this painting that I'm still working on. I actually did, um, Friday night. So Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, it's actually four days ago, but all of my paintings are still good question. My paintings are dry usually in 24 hours. Okay. Now for watching, for taking photographs of paintings, if you are an artist who's doing really tiny stuff, photographing your work, no problem at all. If you're an artist whose paintings are matte, not glossy, but flat matte, easy problem, no problem at all. If you're like me and you do large paintings and they're glossy, huge problem, huge problem. Very difficult to photograph a large glossy paintings. If you've never tried it, you don't realize how difficult it is. So let me show you the system that I've come up with. First of all, you can see here I've got an ordinary cheap office supply store easel right there. I am set up outside, as you can see, outside my garage door. Here's my garage, my m messy garage with tons and tons and tons of stuff in it, <laughs> including grandchildren's toys. Okay, so the, the garage, there's no lights on. The garage is dark, okay? Um, so I set up my easel here. Next thing, very important. I have a big sheet of, this happens to be plastic PVC, foam PVC, for those of you who are experts in such things. It's a, it's a piece of building supply, essentially. And I set that on my easel. Now I am in a little danger of wind, so wind is now an issue. And I also have a piece of scrap lumber that I put here. My painting is going to sit on top of that. Okay, now why am I doing all this? Well, because it's a shiny painting and I want no light coming from this direction. All the light now hitting my painting is coming from out here. Does that make sense? So the lighting is very, very indirect. And why is this board here? Oh, well, okay. And why is this board here? Because if I just set this painting up with bright sunshine behind it, are you with me? If my camera saw sunshine here and here, it would bleed over into the painting along the edges. Does that make sense? So, so this board is here and this board is here to lift it up so that behind the painting. Now, last time I did this and thought about it, somebody thought, well, I thought that gray was the, no, 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 no. This is not like taking, this is not compared to taking pictures of jewelry or little carvings. No, 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 this is not like that. This is not a backdrop. This is just a light blocker. It is not a backdrop. It's just to block light from coming around there. So that's why it's black. Um, that's the color you want it. Now, believe it or not, one more trick I have to do in order to take this picture. And that is, I have to put on a big black coat 
I am not kidding. With this clothing right here, especially as bright as this is, light would come from outside, bounce off my shirt, and bounce onto the painting. Believe me, ask me how I learned all these hard lessons. <laughs> the hard way. And, uh, man, I'm even worried about, even worried about that. Do I have a button here? Okay, I'm just going to have to hold it. Now, believe it or not, I'm taking pictures with a phone. 18 megapixel camera. Whoops, I might not either. This battery might be dead. Oh, I can't believe it. I keep everything charged up. Okay, I'm going to have to break. I'll come back in just a few minutes after I get this charged up. All right, so I'm ready finally to shoot pictures of this. Uh, once again, I'm using a droid phone. I don't know exactly how iPhones compare, but let's assume they're comparable. Um, if you have a professional setting on your phone, I recommend that you learn how to use it and use it. Um, I'll tell you right now, I'm actually green. It's actually is my normal phone and better camera. So I'm going to use that one. As soon as I hang up with you guys, I'm going to use that one. But uh, in the meantime, I'm going to demonstrate with this one. First of all, I typically take, make sure that your lens, by the way, is clean. Sure, use a lens cloth or your wool coat, <laughs> as the case may be. Uh, make sure that lens is clean. <laughs> oh. <laughs> This does beat all. Somehow, in the course of cleaning my lens, I have managed to turn off my phone. Um, which, even though a few minutes ago it said the battery is at 10%, now it says it's at zero. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're going to play act the rest of this here. It's starting up again. So what I typically do is I take one picture of the entire painting. And then... I come in here and I take this painting, I could divide into four pieces. One, two, three, four. I'll take four pictures. Right, not quite that quickly, but you follow me? Each of my noise sound effects, that stands for me touching the, the picture button. Does that make sense? And then I email all of these or to my computer or they show up in Google Photos, whatever. Anyway, they, I get these images onto my computer, which is where we're going next. Um, once again, and if for a painting, I could, I could take two pictures. I think, my, I think my camera is up and operational now. So I will actually take some pictures this time. And no, it's not going to let me take a picture, so I won't. But I hope you understand. Uh, you could take uh, uh, you could take six, one, two, three, four, five, six. That is, if you want a really high resolution. Uh, with that, you'll end up with about. I'll end up in Photoshop with a with a file of about 190 to 120 megabytes of information. Does that? I hope that. I hope you're all following me. If you're not a computer person, you're completely lost and you're not watching this video. So, but this is how I shoot my, shoot my photographs. So next time we meet, we'll be upstairs in my computer. You'll be looking over my shoulder into Photoshop. Okay. This is what I do basically with every single painting that I paint. That's why they pay me the big bucks. <laughs> Hello friends. Let's wrap up this little video where I'm showing how, you how I wrap up affairs when I finished a painting. So the first thing I did is I, I finished the painting, even if it's as simple as glazing, one final glaze. Almost always that final glaze really makes a difference. Very little time, very good payoff for the time. So sometimes I glaze it and I certainly paint the edges, put a wire on it, take it out of the garage and shoot it, photograph it. And now the last thing is I'm up here in my studio and I want to show you what I do here. Uh, so these are the four segments, the four corners of the painting that I took with my little camera phone, right? Now, I am in Photoshop. I don't know if you know what Photoshop is or not. I'm assuming you do. 
up here under File, Automate, Photo Merge. This one function right here is, in my opinion, worth the uh, $22, I think it is, 20 some dollars I pay every month for Photoshop. It would be worth it just for this one function called Photo Merge. It's going to take those four pictures that I just showed you, and if all goes well, <laughs> normally, if it works, it fits them all together into one seamless uh, image. And it looks like it's working. The reason it doesn't work sometimes is I took the pictures wrong and they don't match up. They don't, they, that is, if I accidentally leave a gap in between them, then it, it won't be able to line up the images. But hopefully I didn't do that here today. I didn't test this to make sure it was going to work. I just decided to take my chances. Excellent. Good. It did work. So it took my four images. Now just a little bit of manipulation here in Photoshop. Let me show you how I do that. First of all, I'm going to can collapse that all down into one image and select all and then um, I'm going to um, just straighten it up bring all the corners right to the corner and so this is a, a fairly simple I didn't get carried away I only took four photographs basically of this painting and um, that is giving me a at the moment, a 78 megapixel, just to give you some idea, megabyte, 78 megabyte um, file. So uh, let me change this to full screen just for fun. And if I do um, Control Shift L for levels, see, this is what the computer thinks is a corrected version of my painting. And to do this really well, I need to have the original painting right here. Um, but I don't think that is a good, I don't think that is a good um, modification of my painting. So I'm going to do it by hand, which is what I do 90% of the time anyway. Right now I'm just adjusting, just tweaking the contrast. And I think that'll do, I think, I think the saturation is just a little bit high which generally we like saturation. So, you know, it's easy to get drunk on. Yeah, 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 more saturation. But no, I don't, I, I, I want this painting to be, uh, I like the painting, I like the painting the way it is. I don't want to be cranking the, the saturation up. So I think that's a pretty good representation of my painting downstairs. That's a little bit too big for the screen, but you got it. And uh, then with this, I would, um, let me turn off all these other, the, the four pieces that I, ha I still had open there. So uh, I can do several things. I've ended up with, again, with a 78, meg uh, 78 megabyte, which is pretty high resolution. I don't know how well you can see this. Let me see if I can get you in here just close as possible. Sorry about the earthquake ride. Let's just see together um, what is the resolution of this thing. Okay, starting to pixelate now. The good news is um, the, the dots in the canvas uh, show up as pixels um, long before, now we see pixels, long before, <laughs> there you go, <laughs> long before uh, the pixels themselves show up. So that's a pretty high resolution um, let me just, again, for those of you who are geeks, let's look at um, pixels. Okay, it's, it's 6,000 by 4,500, 6,000 by 4,500 pixels, if that, if that gives you an idea. At 300 dots per inch, that, that comes to... That comes to 15 by 20, and the the canvas is actually. I'm gonna I'm gonna actually tweak it a little bit here and make it exactly 15 by 20 because that's the exact right ratios. So I'm I'm losing just a hundredth of the size of the file. 
So there you go. I could send this off now to sometimes my client, um, sometimes my client, in this case, St. Michael's uh, Episcopal Church, they will want a copy of this so they can reprint it, you know, as a promotional, as a postcard, as a thank you note, whatever. I'll do that sometimes for my client. Uh, other times, I won't for this one. Well, maybe I should. Doggone it. Now I think about it. How many of these people would like a print of this painting? So, yeah, I might I might uh, put this up on uh, Fine Art America and let, let people buy it. Doggone it. That's what I'm going to do. Anyway, so that, that is the end of, of the painting process. Sometimes a final glaze, paint the edges, put a wire on it, photograph it, tweak it in Photoshop, and from here, upload it to Fine Art America and or to my website if I think it's, but it's not. It's not one I put on, one, it, it is not a painting. It's a decent painting, but it's, it's uh, not one I need to put on my website. Now, I could put it, I might put it on my festival website because, uh, Again, this is sort of like a festival. Anyway, that's all. Hope that was instructive. Not as entertaining today as, as it is sometimes, but uh, uh, some really good information perhaps for some of you who are artists and wondering, man, do, do all artists do all this stuff? The answer is, yep, <laughs> we do. Thanks for watching. Good.